style discussion, keeping well within our time limit, so we have plenty of time to talk with everyone in the room. Um, we have to my immediate left, uh, uh, Professor Angel Shu, who is on the faculty at the Yale NUS uh, National University of Singapore College in Singapore, but also this uh, Yale uh, Studies in New Haven. Um, and she's the founder of Data Driven Yale, which is a multidisciplinary research team really at the forefront of applying data science to sustainability questions. Um, to her left is Professor Bronwyn Hayward, who is an associate professor at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand and a major contributor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that is the international body of scientists who try to help define what this problem is. Uh, she's going to talk to us about that. And to her left is someone you might have seen before in the last session, if you were in that room over there. Um, Mr. Prashant Mehra, who is the lead on social inclusion work at Mindtree, the Bangalore-based IT company. And he's going to tell us about some of his work in building platforms for what he described to me over dinner last night as a billion entrepreneurs. Um, so it's going to be a great set of sessions. Um, but we have a lot of expertise I can see in front of me, too. Um, so you didn't come here just to listen. You have an exam question, actually, that you're going to have to answer by the time, which is one I posed at the beginning. It's on there on the screen. Can this kind of model work? I'd like everyone to think about that. Can it work? If not, why not? And if it can work, how? How do we make it work? So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that as we get going. But let's start um, with you, Brahman, if I may, and about how we define this problem. So recently, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released a new report on a really ambitious target, maintaining and limiting climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius in the century. Um, can we do it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> will we do it? Don't Second it question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Second question, will we do it? Uh, first, I'd just really like to thank Vivek Nick because it was great. I was a visiting fellow last year while I was working on this. So it was a very calming time and quite a tense process. Um, so yes, and the report is saying, and your comment about you know repeating things over and over for the same result is possibly a sign of madness. But I think there is that we have seen some quantum shift, and a little bit of this discussion has finally escaped out of its echo chamber and bubble, certainly in our first analysis of take up. But yeah, climate change is changing now. We've already seen one degree of change since the 1850s. We're already experiencing the effect of climate change, of the extreme weather events, the sea level rise, the, the flooding and heat stress. When we started this report, this question, can we do it now? Um, there was a lot of skepticism, like were we already committed to it anyway? Uh, and one of the fundamental findings of the review was no, we are not already committed to it anyway. Then the second thing was, well, what difference would 1.5 make, and my colleague Miles Allen here um, uh, he makes a good, good point that it was almost an intellectual laziness and arrogance of, oh, this is just a political target, and you know, it doesn't make any difference. Um, it makes a huge difference, and all targets are political. And one of the consequences of the report is to say, you know, it's 50% more energy than we already have in the system just to get to 1.5. Uh, it is not inevitable, but it is a political uh, choice to make, and it is massive and unprecedented, and it will require rethinking our economic and our social processes, as well as our transport, how we build our cities, how we move around, how we use our land, all the things we know, but massive structural change. Um, but we gain from that. If we could hold the world's temperatures at 1.5, which is heroic, and the whole report isn't saying just do that, but for the first time putting climate back in a social context of saying also promoting sustainable development, also alleviating poverty. If we can do that, the headline things are things like uh, 10 centimetres less of sea level rise, which at a rough estimate is 10 million people in coastal areas that are affected. It means the difference between, um, if we held it at 1.5 as opposed to 2, it means the difference of things like an Arctic summer that's free of ice uh, once every century versus once every 10 years if we go to two. These are hugely significant changes. So I'll stop there because we've got a lot to talk about. But one thing I'd really thank you for, Tom, is because when I was here, it was conversations that helped me as a political scientist, because people say, you know, why on earth have you got a political scientist on the panel? You can imagine the trolling. Uh, <laughs> 
These are political choices, and I don't think that the community had really understood, which your works really underscored, that we have shifted or, to a system in which we are, in a way, devolving and expecting the community to hold their governments to account. And we, we don't have mechanisms at the moment for enforcing this. And one of the things that the report is really clear about is we are nowhere near the national contributions we need to make if we want to achieve the 1.5. And it is fantastic that we did shift a global conversation uh, in Paris, but now we actually have to, have to actually affect that change, and that's massive. So the pledges countries brought forward in Paris were huge, right? They were bigger and more of them than any other climate change commitments ever before them. But they got us maybe to a 3 or 3.5 degree trajectory, not nearly close to 1.5 degree one. So the big question now is can they step up and will they step up going forward? And I think your report really highlights very clearly the benefits but also the scale of the challenge to do so, but also the possibility to do it. Um, but you mentioned a very important feature of the new kind of catalytic climate regime, which is the role of other actors beyond national governments and actually looking at it as a whole of society problem. And that's been a big focus of your work, Angel, looking at what cities and businesses and investors and other kinds of groups are doing alongside in partnership with nation states or also instead of nation states or even despite nation mm -hmm. states in some yeah. cases like in my own country, the United States. So Angel, what kind of solutions do you see emerging and will they help us get to where we want to get to? Well, I just want to first thank Bronwyn for the excellent work on the IPCC 1.5 degree report. If you haven't read it, I urge you after this panel, go download it. It's pretty dense, but I think it uh, has a lot of the key takeaways that Bronwyn mentioned. And I think one point that I'd like to highlight is that we actually don't have that much time left. And so oh, yeah, I think absolutely. you did a great job in, in emphasizing the difference. What would it look like in our world, 1.5 versus 2 degrees? But we really only have 11 years to figure this out. And so I think that was another key headline and takeaway that the IPCC report communicated that I think hopefully everyone will, will take away also from this discussion. I mean, there's not a whole lot of time left if we have any hope of achieving this 1.5 degree and thank target. And thank you, because that was actually the text the IPCC said. <laughs> I completely forgot. They say yeah. one thing. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, it's just like, I feel like oh, when I'm doing my work, it's constantly tick tock, tick tock, right? Yeah. We only have this, this short period of time to really make a difference. And so this is where I'm hopeful that the new actors that Tom mentioned from cities, states and regions, businesses, investors, civil society groups, universities, <sighs> individuals can really step up and make a difference. And so that's really been the focus of my research. And if we look at the last several decades, the emergence of these actors going into 2015, the Paris negotiations were actually there was a whole other two or three summits of these non-state subnational actors that were alongside national governments debating, coming forth with their own pledges saying, we can step up in these ways, we can commit to deeper emissions reductions, we're going to pledge to go 100% renewable in our operations by 2050, we're going to adopt carbon prices internally in our business operations. I mean, there was a lot of activities and pledges going on. I mean, there were thousands being put forth. And most recently, this past September, Tom and I were both at the Global Climate Action Summit that was convened by California Governor Jerry Brown and former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg to highlight what these different actors are bringing to the table and how they can fill in some of these gaps to narrow the, the gulf between what national governments have pledged and where we need to go if we have any reasonable chance of achieving that 1.5 degree target. And I think it was, it was great. It was, I think, a lot of energy in the room, and it was very optimistic, and I, I left with, it with a good feeling. But I think a question that everyone had on their minds is, okay, but is it enough? And how does this all add up? And is it something that's additional, as you mentioned, or is it already encapsulated, Bronwyn, as you mentioned, in existing policies? Is it just part of the business as usual, the current policy scenario, or are we actually seeing additional measurable reductions? And so that's where the core of my research has been, is to think about how we innovate methods and adapt climate models that the IPCC uses to incorporate explicitly the commitments of these non-state actors. Because if you think about it, it's a really messy accounting problem. And uh, I'm a data geek. I'm going to put that out there, self-proclaimed. And so I, I think about these questions a lot. If you have California, so Jerry Brown at that summit in September said, we're going to go carbon neutral by 2040. And then you have a company like Coca-Cola that says, we're also going to go 100% carbon neutral. And then you've got a city that says, oh, we're going to reduce emissions by 20% by 2020. Well, clearly, all these different actors are nested within the same jurisdiction and, or similar jurisdictions, depending on where they're located. 
And so how do we know that the commitments that they make are not already captured in national government targets or their Paris pledges? And so that's methodologically and scientifically a very difficult question to wrestle with. And I love telling the story of um, right before the Paris climate talks, I went in to meet with our deputy climate envoy of the United States. And I told her what I was doing. I said, I'm going to Paris. I'm supporting the UN Secretariat. I've been doing all this quantification, measuring what all these non-state actors are doing. And she looked me dead in the eye and said, why in the world are you doing this? There's no point to doing this. <laughs> do not do this. She said, the point is not for us to count all of the tons of carbon and get everything absolutely correct, like an accounting ledger, but it's just to show exactly what you said, the political mobilization, because it's important for these various actors to feel like they have buy-in and that they can support the larger goals of the Paris Agreement. And I said, OK, I totally agree with you that mobilization is a key point, but I'm also interested in knowing what's being delivered. How do we know that all these actions that everyone's pledging is actually going to lead to measurable additional reductions? And at that point, there wasn't any analysis or any research that really answered that question. And so my team for the last three years has really been investing a lot of effort into collecting the data, working with the various partners and networks, various cities, companies to collect that information, modify the climate models, and come up with new methods to actually answer that question. And so what we found is that if we look at 6,000 cities' emissions reduction pledges, more than 2,000 companies' targets across 10 high-emitting regions, including the EU, they can leverage an additional 1.5 to 2.2 gigatons of carbon dioxide reductions in 2030. So that's roughly equivalent to double Canada's total annual emissions. And so it's pretty sizable, um, but if we think about the gap again, and there's a new report that's coming out soon that will specify exactly how big that gap is. But the previous research says that gap is somewhere between the order of 13 to 15 gigatons. And so 1.5 to 2.2 doesn't get us all the way there, maybe more, more like a 10 to 15 percent narrowing. But at least it's, it's doing something. And so I think it was important for us to demonstrate, yes, that it is additional. We can quantify the additional potential impact. But I think a major other question that I left the summit with and that we'll be thinking about this next year is there are more efforts that were pledged, more commitments that were being made. How do we actually then translate those commitments into action and ensure that all those efforts get implemented? Because our models are, as you know, Bronwyn, are uh, based on estimations and evaluation of potential impact. But we have very little ex post data of what's actually been delivered. So I think that's, that's really the key that will allow us to understand whether or not these efforts are having an impact and are truly catalytic as you pose in your opening comments. So I'll just leave it there. Great. And I think it's really important to understand exactly where this puts us in terms of our overall trajectory, which is um, in some ways a, a boring accounting exercise, but one with <laughs> very in important consequences, as, as Bowman highlighted. Um, but I forgot to mention one important thing, which is that Angel is spending the term here in Oxford at the Levana School as a British Academy Visiting Fellow. As Brahm mentioned, she was here last year as a visiting fellow. And so, Prashant, there's a trend on the panel. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I hope I we'll see you back <laughs> here sometime soon. Also, the, the deputy assistant uh, Envoy that uh, Angel mentioned, Karen Flinney, was here at Oxford oh, as well great. as a visiting fellow. Oh, so, awesome. so everyone's yeah. implicated in, in a certain <laughs> uh, network. Um, but, Brashan, I want to turn, take this level from the kind of global discussion we've been having now to a more specific context where um, you've been thinking about questions of sustainability, and um, an important part of climate change is actually waste management. Waste management is something uh, globally like 3% of world emissions or something. So. Um, is that right, Angela, or mm -hmm. Bama, um, Something like that. It's, it's a large chunk, about the same size as aviation as a sector is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important we get this part of right for the climate change challenge, but also for every other aspect of sustainability in people's lives um, where they are. So what is I Got Garbage, and how is it working um, to help kind of translate this sort of bottom-up after um, approach? In Thank you. So... Uh, <coughs> Before I jump into what I got garbage, a uh, couple of observations, and then we'll see how I got garbage links to that. Mm. There's a lot of uh, talk about from policy to practice. Uh, there needs to be talk about from practice to policy. Uh, so there are solutions that work big and small and really small and really, really small, like some of the things I'll talk about. Uh, how do you actually harness them out and take them back into policy? 
uh, when we'll see some examples of the kind of work Igot Garbage is doing in that space. Uh, the second, uh, I don't know about how it's in, uh, in Canada or UK or US, but India definitely, I don't see there's any chatter about climate change. Right? So there's a lot of conversation possibly at the government level. Um, at a consumer level, at a citizen level, um, I often think that it's not possible to achieve any of these targets without uh, every 7 billion of us going through some lifestyle change. But there's absolutely no conversation about that. Mm -hmm. And how do we get that? Mm -hmm. So now let's come back to um, I Got Garbage and see how we're trying to, to actually work on both these premises. So before that, uh, uh, maybe a 60 second background on what is I Got Garbage. Um, it's a technology platform we have built at Mindtree in Bangalore. It enables waste pickers to operate as recycling managers. So we've taken the problem of garbage, we've said that there is <coughs> economic value of the material value in both the organic waste, if you turn it to compost, and there's economic value in the recyclables. The value is fairly small, so you need to work with somebody who, for whom that small value is actually relevant. And we found waste pickers as a group uh, uh, at least in India, are the only group that is driving recycling and the value, the, the financial value of, of you know, even those little magnitudes. Except that they work at what we call the end of the waste supply chain. They work at the landfills where they go and scavenge out paper, plastic, uh, instead, we said, and that's very, very inefficient, we said they need to work at the beginning of the supply chain, which is your house, my house, the shopping mall, the place where the waste is generated. We also found that there's a six times increase in recycling efficiency if we are able to convince the households to segregate waste as opposed to have non-segregated waste. So that's the premise with which I got garbage is formed. Uh, so today there are some six different micro business models which waste pickers can deploy. Uh, there are about 10,000 of such waste pickers. They uh, collectively uh, recycle uh, about 300,000 households worth of waste every day. None of this waste reaches the landfill. Now in this the few salient points, one I, I spoke about having the economic incentive for the person for whom the incentive matters. <laughs> so that amount of money may not matter for anybody in this room, for the waste picker it matters, and that's why they drive it. The second is, uh, if you look at the composition of typical waste, right, which is contributing to 3%, 70% of that is organic waste. 70% of organic waste is water which means 50% of total waste is nothing but water. So we said that there ha it makes no sense to transport water from your house to a landfill. Right? Water is heavy. So you are consuming fuel, you are, um, and giving the traffic lot situations of, of any city, you're actually using a lot of fuel, you're causing a lot of emissions in just transporting water to the landfill. The second thing we all know uh, is uh, the impact of methane versus CO2. And so the moment you start piling this waste on top of the other, you're squeezing the air out of it. And all that's happening is out there is anaerobic decomposition. So you're generating huge amount of methane. Mm -hmm. So we said what you need to do to counter that is actually very simple. You need to compost at home. So we built out models and we said it takes you two square feet of space in your balcony to take care of 70% of your waste. And in that two square feet, the height of the garbage doesn't actually cross more than two, two and a half feet. It's well aerated. There's no pressure on it. So it's all aerobic decomposition. So there's zero methane. So neither is there the lack of methane here. Also, you're not transporting this waste. 50% uh, of which is water, 
um, and causing emissions. Very simple, right? Yeah. And of course, we also enabled, we said that, dear waste picker, you need to become a home composting consultant. <laughs> right? So today we have waste pickers, and they have uh, IKEA-style flat pack composting kits. They tie behind their bicycles, and using you know geolocation and you know digital technology, they know smart routes to deliver, etc. Yeah. And uh, they'll they'll sell you a kit. They'll then sell you uh, composting inoculum month on month. They'll sell you seeds to set up your own garden, and then they become a this thing. Now the question really comes down back is that what do we need to do to make sure that we can make a policy out of this? It's actually not complex, right? For us to be able to say that everybody, 7 billion people will compost waste at home. That's a huge implication. Landfills will vanish, literally. Um, and along with it, all the methane, along with it, all the exhaust, you're, all the emission you're doing to transport it. In fact, one state in India we work closely with has done exactly that. It's the state of Kerala, uh, and who's ever seen a tourism site, it goes by God's own country, right? So Kerala has mandated that every family is going to compost at home. Yeah. So an example of how practice uh, leads should lead to and can lead to policy um, uh, than the other way around. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic example because it shows exactly why this fundamentally difficult challenge like climate change actually permeates from every level of policy making to practice from the um, composting bin on your balcony to the intergovernmental processes and everywhere in between. And that's often seen as a challenge. People in political science talk about climate change as a super wicked problem for this reason. That's a technical term. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but this is also one of the ways we can actually solve it. And it's interesting to see governments and even international organizations trying to innovate themselves to think about these kinds of problems and to translate across them. But it's, even though every actor can contribute, there's obviously a special and important role that governments have within this broader ecosystem of solution. So could I ask you just each quickly, what would be the one most important thing you see from your perspective that national governments can do in this more complicated, fluid, um, expansive policy landscape that stretches from the practice at home to the very high levels of international diplomacy. What's one thing governments really are, should be focusing on more where they can uh, drive this kind of complicated policy response forward? Um, can we start with you, maybe, Professor? Sure. Okay. So I think uh, when we design systems, right, we talk about a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach and approaching it from the middle and all of that. I think what the governments really need to do before you go out there and make that pledge, uh, they need to tally the top down design and the bottom up numbers. Right? And so if I can visualize uh, the specific focus on identifying what are those innovative practices that are happening in your country, should they become policy? How is it that those impacts can add up? And independently, this top-down thinking happening that what you could do at a broader policy level and what those numbers add up. Yeah. I think if the governments tally these two numbers before making the pledges, the chances are a lot more that the pledges will hold true. Mm. Absolutely. Oh, I must hear one thing for well, government to do. Two parts to that. <laughs> First is, um, now I have to speak as a political scientist and not as a member of the IPCC on behalf of the IPCC because they can't specifically can't tell governments what to do. Mm -hmm. And then as a political scientist, I'm going to talk about the report a little bit uh, and, and, and do more than one thing. Because if I do anything, I would say you are such an influential group. Please read Chapter 5, our concluding chapter. <laughs> because um, it, we're talking about climate resilient development um, pathways. What would they look like? And there are some key things. I mean, there's the obvious, as Prasad says, the simple things. We have to be at net zero by 2050. And about 45% reductions on carbon over 2017 and about, um, by about 2030, 2040. And by methane, um, we're looking at a 35% reduction. So all of this, plus everything that my country in New Zealand does, matters. But the governments still have a huge role because they provide the framework for this. And... In climate resilient development, we say, look, actually, you have to, as Nairi said at the opening of this session, legitimate decisions. If you're not, it has to be inclusive decision making that has to take people with us. 
or it will be an, another elite set of impositions that are technocratic and are rejected. <coughs> it has, so it has to be inclusive. It has to be transparent and, account, and accountable, which is why Angel's work is so important. And communities have to be able to see immediately what effect really yeah. is happening. Yeah. Um, but it also has to be equitable and just. And it's very explicit in the report um, in Chapter 5. That, and it has been uh, remained there despite... Uh, so it's, it's important to say that these are massive transitions in which you're going to have to think through as a government how to do that. Um, and then there's some things we could do, but we'll talk about that later in a minute. A no, I'm really glad like you that. raised the, the idea of legitimacy and how we make social buy-in to these kinds of policy changes. You know, climate change can often be a very divisive issue in certain countries where it's been politicized. Um, but I love the name of your organization, Prashad, because it tells it all. You know, I got garbage. And we all got garbage, right? This is something we can all relate to. And if you take policymaking to that level, then you create a new kind of political possibility, I think. Let so me Angel, just add another yeah. thing. And I'm, I'm not an expert on climate change, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, little things which I see in my day-to-day -day work. I see an absolute absence of soil and water in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Soil is literally the largest carbon sink. Mm -hmm. right? Not even the trees, right? it's the microbes in the soil which do a whole lot of carbon binding. And, uh, and we all know about how the presence of vegetation influences the microclimate, the temperature profiles mm -hmm. of that, which in turn has implications on vegetation, which in turn has implication on ability to absorb. There's an absolute absence of uh, soil and water in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe, uh, because the carbon footprint really is not the cause, it is the effect. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you're measuring the, out, or the output, not the input, really. Yeah, and that needs to come uh, into the dialogue. Yeah. So the interesting piece of work we started with, with uh, uh, Unilever to arrive at, so the helping design a water platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, to arrive at a water footprint mm -hmm. yeah. um, of every commodity you see. Mm. Right. This is carbon and hopefully something. But in general, I think if we can influence something, need to get soil and water into the conversation and Absolutely. not just carbon. Absolutely. So it's linked to carefully. And people are thinking, well, what does soil have to do with carbon? But actually, um, the world's soil is hugely degraded. And if we just improve the quality of that soil, we'd be sequestering carbon away in these little <laughs> microorganisms that live there and kind of biochar and things like that um, at a massive scale. Mm -hmm. So here's another yeah. example of the kind of solutions that governments need to be linking together. But Angel, what can governments do? You yeah, I, I definitely want to echo what Prashant and Bronwyn said. I mean, Prashant, on the data, your music to my ears, because <laughs> this aggregation and the transparency and knowing what different levels are doing, I mean, that's exactly what the Paris Agreement is, is proposed to usher in compared to the old Kyoto framework that didn't take into consideration all the contributions from bottom-up actors. And I think that's a major difference that this intergovernmental process is trying to change. So right now we're in this process called the Talanoa Dialogues. And so for the last year, the UN has been soliciting inputs from all different organizations but what they can do on climate change, what they're already doing, and how that can help be incorporated and inform the next round of national government pledges that will be taking stock in December. And so I think that that's absolutely critical. Um, and then Bronwyn, on your piece in terms of the, the government coordination, that's absolutely one of the conclusions of our report too. And so one of the parts of the analysis that I didn't get a chance to present, which was if we look at when you have coalitions of governments working alongside non-state actors, the potential for scaled up emissions reductions is much greater. And so what we looked at, we looked at around 21 different cooperative initiatives that includes both national governments and some national non-state actors working in sectors like methane, actually, and other long-lived um, climate pollutants, also in waste, which is a sector that a lot of subnational non-state actors are not focusing enough attention in. And a lot of the non-energy uh, non um, greenhouse gas emissions, there's a lot of potential there. And so when we look at those numbers and the scale of potential in 2030, it could actually put us back on track to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, two degrees, and then also the 1.5. And so that part of the story, I think actually a lot of the media picked up on more 
report, when we launched our report in September, it said, yes, we can do it all. And then I kept having to rein us back and say, well, we can if we have that national government coordination. <coughs> And so there's a lot of, I think, uh, of energy and enthusiasm, as I mentioned, for what bottom-up actors can do. But absolutely, the national governments have to be part of the picture mm -hmm. for coordination, for what we say in the political science literature, orchestration amongst different actors, and then also being able to take the lessons and experimentation from these non-state actors and being able to incorporate those into the national pledges. Mm -hmm. And that's why the exam question that each of you are thinking about, I know, is so important. <laughs> can we make this work and how do we make it work? Because this is a new way of trying to attack a different kind of problem. And so governments don't have a kind of repertoire of experience and case studies they can already draw on. Um, but they're just building it now, trying to build the airplane as they fly it, or the decarbonize the airplane as they fly it, more accurately. <laughs> um, so it's a complicated thing. So let's open it up to the audience. Who has a view on this? How do we make this work? Um, it could be the f a view in the form of a question for the panel, or the view of a short, short <laughs> comment um, answering the question precisely. Let's take three and start with that. Uh, and I start with here, here, and here, and, and then we'll move backwards. Uh, hi, Thomas. Please. A great, great panel. I'll try and be really quick. Um, you know, I work on um, global gridlock uh, issues with, with David Held. And one of the things we've looked at in big science projects like CERN is they often rode a wave of change when they were set up. So CERN at the end of the Second World War, Reproachment, the ITER project, the end of the Cold War. Tira of McKinsey earlier, uh, I think yesterday, made a point that she thought it was a myth that you needed a burning platform to make a big change, that this was a myth buster of McKinsey's work. Um, I actually don't agree with that. I think it's part of the story. And so my point is, you know, climate change issues are in the public domain, but they kind of come and go. Could we create a wave of change? Could there be a major um, you know, thing that captures the public imagination, that then captures government's imagination to really make an effective change? And do you think that that's whatever that wave could be, um, uh, you know, could be created or somehow brought together to force that change a bit more um, you know, yeah. consistently? Yeah, great question. Uh, the second question is here in front. Oh, I sense a pattern. Um, hi, I'm Maitha. I went to BSD last year. I'm now an alumni. Um, I work at the House of Commons, but I'm also involved in climate change policy. And specifically, I did some stuff on carbon credits this summer. So my question is, we all talk about how non-state actors need to be and are involved. However, we need it to pay for them to do it. And we need to have accounting procedures to make sure that the action is measurable. It can't just pay collectively. Because for it to pay collectively, all non-state actors need to do it immediately. It has to pay, as you say, individually. And the way that, they were doing, that we were doing it in the old climate program was having non-Annex 1 countries, developing countries, having climate change pledges, which then private sector firms could contribute towards and extract carbon credits from. Now we're in a climate regime where non-Annex 1 countries, developing countries, and developed countries both have climate pledges and they want to own these climate pledges. If they own these climate pledges, private sector cannot extract carbon credits from that action by financing it. However, a developing country can't design a better system, as you said, we need better decision making systems, unless it has the finance to do this. How, how do you think we need to grapple this huge problem? Great, so how do we get incentives aligned correctly and how do we make the finance to lubricate the system to do it? Uh, final question this round is the gentleman here in the blue jacket, yeah. Then we'll move backwards. Uh, thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, it's interesting that we ended, <clears throat> excuse me, on the point of orchestration and international and national orchestration. You're probably familiar with the work of Eleanor Ostrom, mm -hmm. who talks about polycentrism and um, as an approach to managing common resources, taking a more local approach, because that's where you can build trust, and trust is required to, to manage common resources. Um, as you've said, mobilizing to act on climate change is, is a really political problem more than a scientific one almost now. Um, Anti-climate political actors and sort of anti-globalist movements are trying to erode that trust in these global institutions like the IPCC and Paris agreements and things like that. Um, is there a real risk that this is going to sort of not stop us in our tracks but really hold us up? And what do we do about that? And how do we, in, if, if we need to take another approach, how do we start enabling local action and those non-state actors? Yeah. 
Great set of questions. We'll start with those. So um, we had a question about how do we create these uh, waves of change? How, where is this going to foresee moments that's going to give us the momentum we need? Well, how do we align incentives in finance? And how do we create trust that you acquired for orchestration and polycentrism in a world of uh, populism and geopolitical tension? So mm -hmm. can I ask maybe, Prashant, would you be, take on the incentive question? How do we get this, um, align these people's um, you know, financial needs and incentives um, to make progress in a world where we don't have a kind of simple uh, trading system, maybe like we had under Kyoto. Um. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think at some level, uh, I don't see financing this um, as an overly complex problem. Uh, the finance is of it itself. Uh, it is a political <coughs> problem. If you look at India's development budget, and we are a poor country, it's $200 billion annually. Uh, it's not a small amount of money for the kind of program <coughs> the country runs. What is the allocation? So what is the India commitment I do not track on climate change? But nowhere close to $200 billion. <laughs> 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 so uh, I think it boils down to taking the conversation. So one of the things the politicians are always worried about is losing elections. <coughs> I think you have to take the conversation down. Uh, somebody advised in my previous panel, and I was asking, how do I scale? I got garbage. And he said, you have to have the citizens demand that from the government mm -hmm. to build citizen opinion. The moment you have that, uh, one big hurdle you've crossed is that the politician is not so scared anymore of taking a slightly difficult decision because the public is asking them to take it mm. and not the other way around. Yeah. And I think I think that's exactly the right point. And I think it <coughs> underscores a fundamental shift in how many of us are thinking about the climate problem anymore. Um, it's not always the case that taking action on climate change is costly. Right? This is a fundamental assumption of the tragedy of the commons framing or the kind of old style model which required this sort of trading. But many things you do on climate change are actually net cost positive. Um, and the platform. No, the fact is right? that who's causing climate change? We are. Exactly. The government is not causing any climate change, so it can't fix it. <laughs> Indeed. So we are causing it. See, my daily plastic footprint is about 15 grams. And that makes India the world's largest plastic polluter. And I think, no, 15 gram a day, uh, how do I get rid of it? And it'll have, a, but till I actually do that, we'll continue to say 188 million tons of plastic annually India puts in landfills. Yeah, great. So, yeah. No, good, excellent point. Uh, can we jump to this important legitimacy question? Because this was a really a big topic throughout the conference for the last few days. How do governments mobilize public buy-in to a whole range of policies, especially these kind of abstract ones? Well, and also, if I can just build from that. <laughs> Sorry about coughing all the way through it. Um, because I think we need, this is a political scientist now, um, and I've worked a lot with my colleague Karen O'Brien about from Norway about um, multiple levels of dissent. Because it is a politics of dissent now. How do you dissent from the norm and from, and actually it is governments. I, I have to say, Prasad, in, in the Indian context, there are government decisions that are really highly um, problematic. So um, the trouble is that the business as usual model <laughs> um, suits enormously powerful interests. Um, and actually, so you are constantly confronting power in this. And as Kevin Anderson and Thomas Piketty have shown, if just the top 10% of us, which includes me, uh, in terms of carbon emissions, just reduced to the average European lifestyle, we'd have reduced our carbon emissions by 30%, just like that globally. So it's very difficult to get buy-in when people look at that and go, yeah, right. Um, you know, I'll compost, but yeah, right. Um, or eating less meat. I mean, I think that was another exactly. Conclusion. Whereas I would just be grateful to eat things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but and on the other hand, I, I, I also strongly sympathise and, and thank Prasad for this comment about politicians needing manoeuvre because talking to a lot of politicians once they retire, because they won't talk to you about it when they're in the, but afterwards on reflection. A lot of people realise now that our economic growth model and our and our 
our economy based on constant growth isn't working. It's not that radical, really, to talk about degrowth and post-growth. It's just politically incredibly sensitive because we don't really have a realistic plan B. And a lot of politicians are aware that they haven't got any options at the moment to offer communities, to raise communities without this constant economic growth. Um, but the thing I come back to about how you might affect change in this context, um, and we can come back to financing, but Angel might want to pick that up, is, is this lovely work that um, John Barry from Queen's at the moment is doing on a syllabus of radical hope. Um, because we don't really have the right at the moment to take away from our students hope. Um, and not in a Pollyanna, total optimism way, but one thing that's incredibly frustrating working in climate policy is many of my, my colleagues who I love dearly, it's almost as if we're willing it on. You see, they're never going to do it. They're never going to do it. By the way, fund my lab. I can extract carbon for you or something. <laughs> I mean, this report is the end of magical thinking in that sense because it also says very clearly the technology doesn't exist at, um, at scale. And if it does, we're not sure people will buy into it. Mm -hmm. But when I think about my own country, which has gone through a whole 360 in terms of its politics on climate change in the last year, the two things made a huge difference. One was structural reform back in 1993, which introduced a proportional mixed member system. So we've got a coalition government. And two, when that coalition government suddenly found itself in power, almost to its own surprise, to be really honest, it, um, it didn't actually have a plan. But the people who did have a plan were a group of students who developed a carbon zero bill. I'd been a bit critical of those students. I feel terrible about it because they're quite technocratic. But look, good on them. They had a climate zero bill. We got a progressive government. They said, New Zealand can be quite climate zero. Here's the bill. And now that's our legislation. Give or take a bit of a... Um, it, it's, uh, we're getting in cross-party buy-in. And our client, now we have to make it work. So I think this is a country where we have really strong agricultural pushback. It's very difficult to get by, and this is going to be difficult issues of justice. But in the moments of radical hope, actually doing something matters. And doing something with purpose is even more powerful. Mm -hmm. So last week we had here in Oxford, uh, Christiana Figueres, who was UNFCCC's <coughs> Executive Secretary during the Paris Agreement, talk about how she was a stubborn optimist. Mm -hmm. And now we have a radical hope. Uh, <laughs> I think Desmond Tutu once said, I'm not an optimist, I'm just a prisoner of hope. <laughs> so we have a lot of good ideas here about how to think about this problem. Angel, what do you see as this kind of, um, how we mobilize these questions? Responding to the question about uh, foreseen moments, how do we generate the kind of oomph we need to politically get these things done? Because we have a big task ahead of us over the next few years to get a ratcheting up of the Paris Agreement commitments you know, by 2020. So mm -hmm, how are we going to do that? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll respond to your question, I think, also to your point about financing, because I think some of them go hand in hand. And to steal a beat from Christiana, who I hosted at Yale a couple of months ago, I mean, she, her, her whole belief and the reason why she's so optimistic is because we're seeing the momentum shifting away from the idea that climate change and acting on climate change is just a cost and it's just a burden and we need people to pay into the system and to pay to take any action on climate change. So her big takeaway in her thesis is that companies are actually acting on climate change because it's in their business interest. And so right now, the cost of coal is just simply not as cost competitive in a lot of contexts compared to other fuels that are less greenhouse gas intensive, such as natural gas, and also solar in a lot of countries is now more cost competitive. I'd like to also bring up China, which I study quite a lot. They found that actually investing in clean technology is good for the economy and has made them a, national, a global leader on, on clean energy. And so they're really seeing that actually it makes a lot of sense, not just for the environment and climate change, but actually for their economic growth to invest in wind and solar and hydro. And so they're really leading the world in all of those technologies. And so I, I would say that that's, that's, one, that's one, I think, hope for optimism is that we're seeing a lot of shifts where a lot of companies are acting because it's in their business interest. And then I think something that people like saying too or, or pointing to is the fact that we have had, in many cases, an implicit price on carbon. In many, it just hasn't explicitly been called as such. So I think, it, in, in my intro into environmental studies class, we like to talk about choice editing, right? So if you take away some of the choices and options from people and don't brand it as a carbon tax or a, a tax on, on fossil fuels, then they might be more amenable to adopting some of these these changes. Um, but yeah, to your question about the how to swing the, the pendulum and the momentum to get people to really act. I mean, um, one of the, after the IPCC report was released, I think um, 
I really like this I, I got garbage framing because I think that that's uh, one of the points that, that the IPCC report was trying to make is, and, and Prashant, you also brought it up, we're, we're all contributing to the problem. And um, so how do we actually localize these messages um, in a way that responds to different groups and can find those touch points for people to be encouraged and, and, and catalyzed to actually act? And so there's a great project also at Yale, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, where they do tons of surveys, primarily focused in the United States, to figure out, okay, what are the types of messages and how do we segment different populations to understand <laughs> which messages work for different communities and populations. And I think that's exactly what um, I think all of us have to, have to be doing. How, to, how can we actually bring those people who are not already, already at the table, who are not in this room, presumably, that care about climate change, to get them to, to change their mind? And that's, as you said, Roman, that's so hard. I mean, I think that's really the, the, the thousand pound um, <laughs> elephant in the room that, that everyone um, doesn't like to, to talk about because it does require radical lifestyle changes on the, on, the, on the parts of everyone. I mean, we have to stop, start flying less, we have to eat, eat less meat, to think about our transportation choices and, and our lifestyle cho choices if we really ever hope to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Great. So that's another idea in the moment. We have a big conference coming up next year in September of 2019. The Secretary General is going to be hosting heads of state, but also mm -hmm. CEOs, mayors, businesses, all sorts of people to try to really put a big push before 2020 for an increase in ambition. This is similar to what happened in 2014 before the Paris Agreement. So here's a good moment for us all to think about latching onto next year. Okay, we have we started our panel a bit late, but we're only now on to lunch. So in, is, eating is very important, hopefully in a low carbon way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're going to take one more rapid fire round of questions, rapid fire, and then a rapid fire round of answers, and then close up. So we're going to um, look to the back of the room. So I see one there, um, the gentleman here in the middle, and then the gentleman here on the end. Thank you. Um, my name is Jenny Richmond. I live locally in Oxford. I'm an international development consultant. And I was really inspired by I Got Garbage. Um, and in my mind, I'm sort of thinking local and global. And, you know, obviously that's how we've bounced around in the conversation, which I think has been really, really useful. So I was just wondering um, from you on the I Got Garbage example, I was relating it to our um, systems here in the UK where we have a sort of composting system that the local authority leads on often, but it's really varied. So my sister lives in Birmingham, they don't compost at all. So the authority there has just made a decision not to bother with food composting at all. Um, whereas here in Oxford we do. So it just, and, and what you said about Kerala, really, um, really useful to hear how an, uh, you know, a state authority has made a decision and just mm. you know, made policy on it. So I guess my question to you is whether you've done any international awareness raising using your model, which is local, and, and sharing that, um, and I'm thinking to myself, how does that relate here to the UK and the sort of triggers and levers we can use to try and persuade people to do their own behavior change and then that policy change. So it's a bit of a um, thought Great. process. Yeah. Uh, how do we question. diffuse grid models from different parts of the world to, to learn from each other? Question here then, please. Uh, hello, my name is Michal Droczek. I'm an MPP student here at the Blavatnik School. Uh, I come from Poland, which will be the host of the Conference of Parties this year and which is also not an eagle of climate action, uh, <laughs> to say lightly, but referring to this discussion about uh, legitimacy and top-down and bottom-up approach, I wanted to ask you about the EU climate policy. We are part of the emissions riding scheme, which is probably the most effective uh, scheme worldwide. And because of the recent uh, uh, introduction of this uh, market stability reserve, prices of emission of uh, one ton of uh, carbon dioxide will rise to almost 25 euros per ton, which hits uh, Poland very heavily since around 80% of our energy is produced from coal yeah. and which causes anger of both consumers and industry. Mm. So I just wanted to ask you how you evaluate this policy, how to deal with such a hard case as mm. Poland within the broader framework of European or let it be global scheme. Great. So in a common European framework, how do we deal with the country that's, as you said, not an eagle of climate action, uh, but has a ma massive coal issue? Uh, Jose Maria. Thank you. Um, I'm a doctoral student here. So I think the big punching bag of the time is populism. And mm -hmm. I want to push back on that. So but I, I think that from the liberal and technocratic leanings, which I share, one thing that uh, makes us uncomfortable, uncomfortable with populism is that they are not only leaders of the government, but also leaders of like public leaders in, in that sense. Um, so, and then 
with, with the kind of things that we are supposed to be challenging for uh, sort of overcoming the problem of sustainability in the world, it seems that we need some other kinds of leaders. And I wonder whether populism is a form of politics that would be sort of uh, uh, an alternative for climate politics itself. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, the, the probably the most easy case to call on this is probably Lula in Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wonder whether you think that sort of in the longer run, the challenge of climate change will give us a different type of politics. Mm. Great question. So let's start um, with you, Prashant, if we can. Um, can we take I Got Garbage Global? Yes, of course. Specific thing uh, of what you're saying, uh, you uh, always need local champions. Okay. So here's a promise. You identify local champions in Birmingham, and I'll work with them. Do the first few meetings with the local municipality, and they'll take it over. It's a, see, we, very important to work with local governments. Uh, in another uh, case we were discussing some other day, and we realized that uh, an, another of our platforms, we are causing about 1,000 government officials to go to government schools every day mm. with volunteers. Mm. In that context, uh, that partner said, we always talk about community engagement and policy advocacy with the government. Mm. So with the community, we engage and we collaborate. With the government, we only do advocacy. Let's flip it around. We never say, you know, do you community advocacy to the community. Community will throw you out. And we don't say we'll collaborate with the government. So let's talk about collaborating with the local government. For all their good intent, there is a knowledge need. There is a, a, a you know, love to be felt both ways, really. Mm. Um, and such issues. So Kerala didn't happen in a day. Bangalore, what we've done, it's taken us seven years to reach here. Um, so we had to find local champions. And then uh, I'll come with my team, and we'll initiate <laughs> the dialogue. Well, good. We've already made a step forward. And just to know, you know, in this new kind of Catholic regime, we're really banking on these kinds of diffusions to occur, right? For lessons learned to be innovations to appear one place and then to go global. And if we don't get that kind of soft, <coughs> soft but really important um, information flow going, um, it's probably going to be very difficult. Like it is in Poland, for example. Um, Angel, can you tell us where you see that? You know, how do we deal with these really hard? It comes from coal. Mm -hmm. People burn coal in their houses for warmth. Uh, many workers are involved in mining coal. How do we deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really tricky question. And unfortunately, I just feel like there are some countries that are going to lose out with respect to increasing restrictions on, on carbon. Um, so in China, for example, sorry, I keep pointing to China, but that's where a lot of my research is. I mean, they, they, they came to that realization. So coal is responsible for 65% of their or energy mix, 85% of their electricity generation. So it's not too dissimilar from the Poland situation. And they realize that it's causing huge amounts of air pollution and leading to a astronomical loss of lives, about 5 million lives um, a year in China alone. And so that, it has a, a human health toll as well. And so they are now working to transition away from coal, shutting down a lot of coal uh, mines and also trying to increase natural gas as part of their energy mix, and then also I'll focus on renewables. So I think Poland needs to start looking into some of those options and solutions, uh, realizing that this is a problem that's not going away and that we really drastically need governments to shift and decarbonize to have any hope of, of achieving our goals. And I mean, in the old ETS, the way to handle it was simply buying those allowances, right? Um, and so, I mean, and I think that's also one of the problems is that the initial allocation scheme in the ETS was not done in a way that really truly recognized the true cost of carbon, both from a social and economic perspective. Mm -hmm. And so then that led to this crash of the, of the price of, of allowances. And um, so, I mean, I'm hoping that with this rise, I mean, that's going to really incentivize Polish decision makers to, to try to reform some of those practices. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Bronwyn, if you wanted mm -hmm. to add. Or yeah, well, mm. if I just go really quick Please. on the three. Yeah. So the first on the I Got Garbage, which I think is great, but I think we have to do in our communities what it is that is going to make the biggest difference. And you got energy problems, you know. <laughs> so actually, garbage is easy to focus on in the UK. You need to sort it out, yeah. But it's your energy and your energy demand and your way it's produced and the communities that are locked into that and can't easily shift. That's where we need to put that energy, I would think, from the outside. We've got farming problems at home. Um, the ETS, 
this is an unpopular position, but I think the ETS is a solution from last century. It's like papal indulgences. We're going to have to have some kind of emissions trading scheme, of course, because we have to govern and manage. But most countries, including my own in New Zealand, have made the ETS our central prop, and it is never going to get us to where we need for major change. First off, it's really technocratic, disempowers people. Our experience in New Zealand has it's been highly corrupt, and we spent vast amounts of public money on really on schemes that were just dodgy and corrupt, basically. Um, so you need a cap on, you need a cap if you're going to use it, you need really good transparency and accountability, you need a closed system, but it also has to be just a small part of your policy. And this is a forum in which many of you are highly influential in that area. Please change this. Please change this emphasis away. And finally, this question about popularism. This is what motivates me. It motivates my work and it worries, keeps me up at night, almost more than the climate, is how do we maintain democracy through vast change? Because a rabble is not a citizenry. And people are hurt in those moments of rising anger and populism. The lovely work of Bonnie Honoig about emo um, emergency politics is really important here. And how do we sustain democratic systems through great periods of economic and social change that are really deeply democratic. Um, and I think that's our responsibility, is to think really hard and to act as activists in that. Um, but anyway, I'll hop off my soapbox. I'm just grateful <laughs> to be here. I think it's a really important note to end on, because as we look forward, um, we have two massive trends that are going to shape this. And Jose Maria's question is really poignant here. What will climate change politics look like, not just this year, but as we go forward into 2030, 2050? We have climate change. It's already have one degree of change we've achieved uh, since the Industrial Revolution. We're going to have more, hopefully not too much more, but it's going to be more. And that impact is already quite hard, and it's going to get bigger and bigger. We also have, we're also decarbonizing faster than we ever have before. And these two trends create really different kinds of politics, right? They're beginning to create certain kinds of asset classes, either climate vulnerable assets like Miami Beach, or the Marshall Islands, or forests, or agricultural things. And we have climate forcing assets like ExxonMobil, or um, all of the cars that people are driving, or all of these things. And one of them has to go, right? We can't have both. Yeah. It's a sharp choice, and that choice is getting sharper and sharper as these two trends accelerate. And that's going to change our politics in lots of ways. Um, and so I think we're going to see a shift from what you might call distributional politics, about who gets what, how, when, to a more existential politics, about which do we have, Miami Beach or Exxon, yeah. the Marshall Islands, or Polish coal mines. Mm -hmm. And these are really harsh challenges, right? And politics is going to struggle to deal with them in a way that preserves yeah. the democratic values that, that Brahm is talking about. So we have a big challenge going forward. Um, but radical hope. We have <laughs> radical hope. We have summer optimism. And this is why I think we are, it's really exciting that even at this really critical moment where it looks like all might be going in a bad direction, we see new models and new innovations coming forward. Yeah. And as, as kind of public servants, people who are interested in the challenges of government, it's incumbent on all of us to make them work. So I hope you'll join us in that challenge. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to the panelists. And now it's time for lunch. Yeah.